My name is Jason Merrill, and today we're talking about breast cancer. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and with us is Dr. Will Galanders, a breast surgeon at the Seidman Cancer Center at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine. Uh, the two of us will be talking about breast cancer, but we'll be taking your questions as well. You can send us them via Facebook at facebook.com slash Barnes Jewish Hospital, and on Twitter at Barnes Jewish or you can email them to us at barnesjewish at bjc.org. So uh, we'll get those as we go along. Dr. Glanders, thank you for joining us. Yep, thank you, Jason, for asking me to be here. No, thank you for doing so. A breast, a breast cancer diagnosis is not a death sentence, is it? No, it is not a death sentence. It couldn't be further from the truth. We have um, very effective treatments for breast cancer, and we have a very good track record treating breast cancer. Most patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer are actually cured of their disease, or if they're not cured, they live with their disease and they eventually die of some other disease. Mm -hmm. How important is early detection? Early detection is very important, and um, probably it has had a major impact on our success treating breast cancer. Most breast cancers are now detected at when they're very small. Um, or they're detected um, at the earliest stage, stage zero, when it uh, remains non-invasive. So we um, have had a very good track record with breast cancer screening, and I think it has impacted breast cancer mortality. And when you talk about breast cancer screening, there is a lot of controversy that surrounds that. Some, uh, some people say every other year, some people say every year, some mm -hmm. people say don't start doing it at 40. What, what are your thoughts on that? What are, what are your recommendations to tell women about right. when they should start getting screened? Well, we do feel strongly about the importance of breast cancer screening at Washington University School of Medicine. And there, are, there is some controversy, um, but we follow the American Cancer Society guidelines, which recommend um, starting screening at age 40, and then we recommend an annual screening mammogram, you know, so a mammogram every year starting at age 40. We are convinced that that's probably the um, best uh, strategy for screening. Now, there are some uh, risk factors that make it appropriate for a woman to get screened before 40, correct? Mm -hmm. what, what are the risk factors that, that change the game, so to speak? Right. Well, I guess the major risk factor would be family history. And usually, um, a lot of women are confused about um, the risk factors associated with family history. Usually, we say that if you have a first-degree relative who has um, breast cancer or history of breast cancer, then that means that your risk of breast cancer is increased. So a first degree relative means that if your mother, sister, or daughter was diagnosed with breast cancer, then that means that you have an increased risk of breast cancer. So if it's a, your grandmother or your second cousin or cousin, there, there's a small increased risk, but not a significant increased risk. And so specifically for patients, who have a first degree relative who was diagnosed with breast cancer at a young age, then we would typically recommend initiating screening at an earlier age. We had a question last week from Kat on Facebook who asked, how far back in a family generation do you have to look back to know if you're looking for hereditary cancer? It is a first degree relative, but is there, are there any other um, things you should think of if, if it does go to well, a great grandmother or something? The, the main thing is, is that for hereditary breast cancer, the risk are if there's any history of breast or ovarian cancer, if the breast cancer is in a um, premenopausal or younger woman, if there's any history of bilateral breast cancer, if it's in multiple um, relatives, that would be um, all kind of be red flags for a familial history of breast cancer. Most breast cancers are not familial and they're not related to a gene mutation. Most patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer, there's no family history. Yeah. How different are breast cancers? I, I read something you once said that no two breast cancers are alike. Um, right. Are they different diseases in some cases? Well, we say that um, breast cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. In other words, there's all types of different breast cancer. And um, we use um, a biomarker profile now to direct therapy. We um, test for the estrogen receptor, 
the progesterone receptor and for expression of HER2. And we can use those basic biomarkers to separate breast cancer into um, hormone receptor um, responsive breast cancers, triple negative breast cancers, and HER2 overexpressing breast cancers. But we now know through um, gene expression profiling and genome sequencing that the breast cancers are quite diverse. And if you were to compare two breast cancers and their genetic fingerprint, they're very different. Now, if someone is diagnosed, what, what are their options? Yeah. There's three main treatment modalities for the treatment of breast cancer. Surgery is one of the most important treatment modalities for the treatment of breast cancer. And then there's medical therapy, and medical therapies include um, endocrine therapy, which is typically a pill that you take by mouth, chemotherapy, which is typically are medicines that you get by vein, and then also radiation therapy. So commonly, um, patients with the new diagnosis of breast cancer will meet several different physicians and their um, breast cancer will be treated um, with a team approach, and it's a combination of those different modalities. Almost all patients um, will require surgery, and then um, depending on the stage of the breast cancer, we may also recommend those other treatments. Are there advances in surgery? Uh, there have been advances in surgery. I'd say that the biggest advance in the last 10 years was is the fact that we're no longer recommending aggressive surgery. We, most patients now are treated with just um, breast conservation therapy, which is um, we just remove part of the breast and not the entire breast. We also now, instead of removing all of the lymph nodes, we typically just remove one or two lymph nodes and just to understand whether or not there's any spread to the lymph nodes. Um, those are some of the biggest advances so that, you know, that surgery is now much less aggressive than it was in the past, but we still get the same excellent results. There are many patients who now opt for a double mastectomy if, if mm -hmm. they have the option because there's that thought of, I just, I don't even want to ever have to deal with this again if it would mm -hmm. show up in the other breast. How common do patients ask about something like that? It's not uncommon for patients to ask about a, a double mastectomy. We don't typically recommend a double mastectomy because if you have breast cancer in the right breast, doing a mastectomy in the left breast really doesn't impact the treatment for your right breast cancer. Um, but, you know, choices about breast cancer surgery are a very personal decision. And some women are, um, feel very strongly that they would like to have breast conserving surgery. And some women feel very strongly that they would like to have more aggressive surgery. And, and, and the main goal of doing a double mastectomy is to prevent disease in the future. A personal history of breast cancer does mean that you're at an increased risk of developing breast cancer in the future, but it's still a very low risk, and, 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 and doing a double mastectomy is certainly not required. Now, uh, earlier this year, there was a study showing some breast cancer patients may no longer need to have all of their lymph nodes removed. Right. Um, has that changed the approach surgeons have in, in treating breast cancer? Oh, it certainly has. I mean, that was a very important study. It was a study that um, took years to complete, and the results have definitely changed our care. In the past, we did a sentinel lymph node biopsy. We removed one or two lymph nodes from um, the axilla, which is the area underneath the arm. And if there was a positive lymph node that contained breast cancer, then we typically recommended removing all of the lymph nodes. Typically, there's between five and 25 lymph nodes underneath the arm. And, we, and removing all the lymph nodes can be a, a very aggressive surgery and you can get swelling afterwards. Now um, we know, and this study was um, very um, well designed and, um, and w provides very convincing evidence that removing those lymph nodes is not necessary. Mm -hmm.
We've uh, got some questions that have been emailed to us at barnesjewish at bjc.org. And if you'd like to participate, you can send us your questions on uh, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, it's at barnesjewish is our Twitter handle and facebook.com slash Barnes Jewish Hospitals, our Facebook page. And I was saying earlier, you're the first physician who has ever said that they actually had a Facebook page, <laughs> although you don't look at it much. Well, I do look at it, but oh, not okay. every day. Okay, well, that's acceptable. Okay. That's, fine. that's fine, that's fine. So one of the questions we've had, um, you know, it is so important to know your family history. Uh, K underscore email is, if you're adopted and don't know your medical history, what age should you have your first mammogram? I would recommend age 40. Okay. To start your screening mammograms. Right. She had a follow-up question. If you've had a breast reduction, does this cause complications in seeing potential tumors, or does it help? Um, breast reductions um, don't always impact on breast cancer screening. Sometimes, if there's scar tissue related to breast reduction surgery, it can uh, make the mammogram more difficult to interpret. But overall, I would say that it doesn't significantly um, impact breast cancer screening. Right. Um, earlier this uh, year, you were a recipient of a national grant from the Komen Foundation, the, mm -hmm. the Komen for a Cure, the Race for the Cure here in St. Louis is a, a huge um, fundraising effort to raise money for breast yeah. cancer. And you were one of few who got that national grant mm -hmm. to look at a, a vaccine for breast cancer. Talk right. about that. Right, so we were very excited to receive this award. It was a Komen Promise Grant um, Award, and so there was one of two that were um, awarded nationally. And it was the focus of our research is on the development of a personalized breast cancer vaccine. Um, genome sequencing has really um, revolutionized our understanding of breast cancer. And we can now use genome sequencing to rapidly and systematically identify all of the mutations that are present in a individual patient's breast cancer. And we can use that information to design a personalized vaccine. And um, you know, this is really um, very exciting to the um, tumor immunologist. I consider myself to be a tumor immunologist and a breast cancer surgeon, but as a tumor immunologist, it's very exciting because we've never really had a research tool that would allow us to rapidly and easily identify these um, unique tumor antigens or mutations that are present in a tumor. So really this is the first time ever that we've been able to um, target these mutations and we really are very hopeful that that will be a um, effective strategy for um, generating an immune response and um, treating breast cancer. There's now um, lots of evidence to suggest that there's a interplay between the immune system and the cancer. And if we can just reprogram that interplay, it can have, um, you know, can be very effective for the treatment of cancer. There's already a prostate cancer vaccine that's been FDA approved. It seems to work um, just as well as chemotherapy in patients who have metastatic prostate cancer. So we're hoping to see similar impact in breast cancer. This approach with personalized medicine, do you see this being the future of, of breast cancer treatment and looking at somebody's specific genetic profile and applying? I think there's a lot of people who think that it's gonna be the future of cancer therapy. And there's, um, nationally, there's many who are working with this and similar technologies to really understand the genetic profile of a specific cancer and what pathways are um, causing the cancer to be um, over-aggressive and, um, and then trying to target those specific pathways. So there's a lot of promise with this um, strategy and it really is amazing how um, this technology has evolved, and it's um, now really, um, uh, it's gotten to the point where almost many investigators can use this tool. Before, it was um, so expensive and so um, time consuming that it really wasn't applicable. But now, the technology has evolved so much that we really can use this almost 
on an everyday basis. What other research are you doing that people should know about? Well, um, Many things, but yeah. let's say if you were to pick two. Uh, well, <laughs> I think, you, th you know, the, in my laboratory, the main focus is on this cancer vaccine development. But I think, you know, in the, the greater um, breast cancer research program, there's um, obviously a significant interest in using these sequencing technologies to understand breast cancer. And then, just like you said, now that we've identified um, which genes are mutated in the breast cancer, how can we best target those? So we're taking that information from the genome sequencing and then starting to study it and determine what is the best way to target it. Um, one thing that's also very interesting is that we're now using um, human um, patient-derived um, breast cancer explants in mice as a model system for studying breast cancer. So um, patients, when they have surgery, we take a little bit of their tumor with their permission, and then we um, establish a tumor explant in, um, in, a, in a mouse, and then we can test therapies in that mouse to determine whether or not um, they are effective for the treatment of breast cancer. So in the future, um, it's likely that many of the medications that we have to test now in patients will be tested first in mice in these really robust tumor models. And of course, I guess the one other thing that I would mention is that uh, um, we uh, now have a really um, uh, strong program in cancer prevention and with the recruitment of Graham Kolditz, we're looking at um, some of the things that predispose to breast cancer development and try to understand how we can um, you know, prevent, use that information to prevent breast cancer and minimize the risk factors that predispose to breast cancer. Okay. One of the uh, areas of research at Seidman Cancer Center that our Antonella Rastelli does is uh, looking into vitamin D in breast cancer. Mm -hmm. I know she had something earlier this year that said that vitamin D was beneficial in, in um, relieving pain associated with breast cancer. Of a question, I've heard conflicting things about vitamin D and breast cancer prevention. Uh, do you have any insight onto yeah. that one? Or? Well, I'm not really an expert in vitamin D and breast cancer prevention, so that's, I'm going to have to get back to you on the answer to that. I mean, uh, the, the reader wanted to know the latest, and yeah. I don't have, I don't know what the latest information is on the vitamin D, That's so fine. I'm going to have to pass on that. I'll, I'll send you an email so you can update your reader. Okay. Uh, why is breast cancer so much more prevalent than years ago? Is it an aging society, environmental factors? What's your best guess? Yeah, that, that, uh, that's a good uh, question. I think all of those um, contribute. You know, the, the age is certainly a risk factor for breast cancer. If you look at our um, statistical models for predicting risk of disease, you know, age is one of the main um, risk factors that go in. So as our population ages, that becomes more prevalent. Now also, you know, breast cancer screening um, uh, plays into that w as well because we're diagnosing more of these breast cancers at an earlier stage. So, um, you know, there's at when they are still non-invasive, when if we diagnose them at that earliest stage, they're um, very readily treated and with a very high success rate. But some people believe that that may impact on the um, prevalence of breast cancer. That one of the biggest things that we've learned in the last five years is that um, hormone replacement therapy is a major risk factor for breast cancer. And um, when that research was published um, and um, many doctors asked their patients to stop taking hormone replacement therapy, we actually saw a decrease in the prevalence of in breast cancer and the numbers of breast cancers that were being diagnosed. That was fairly um, dramatic. There was almost a 5% decrease in the incidence of breast cancer, and um, many people believe that that was directly related to women stopping their hormone replacement therapy. So the, the, uh, 
So I, I would say that there hasn't been a huge change in the prevalence in the last 10 years. And if anything, at one point, there was actually a decrease related to those factors. We had another question emailed. Has research shown any evidence of breast cancer being linked to a history of autoimmune diseases? Um, her example is uh, celiac disease or at high risk of developing Hodg non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Have there uh, been any such connections found with breast cancer? Well, um, there, there's no um, huge risk associated with autoimmune disease and breast cancer. Um, I guess the one that the, the reader or the follower viewer. or the viewer follower, yeah. that um, mentioned non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, like if you have a history of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and you are treated with radiation as a young person, then there certainly is an increased risk of developing breast cancer in the future. So that would be the, you know, so there are some um, treatments that are associated with increased of risk of developing cancer at a later date. And one of them is the radiation associated with the treatment of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma if it was in the area um, of the breast. Okay. Um, overall, what's the message you want to get out about breast cancer? Well, I think just circling back to that first um, comment and question that you had, you know, there's, um, I like to tell my patients who have a new diagnosis of breast cancer that we have a very good track record treating breast cancer. And um, we all know of women who've um, been diagnosed with breast cancer who've died of breast cancer, but we don't quite hear as much about the women who were diagnosed with breast cancer and are breast cancer survivors. You know, a lot of times since the surgery is so, um, uh, so much less invasive now than it was in the past. You know, you don't even realize that um, women are breast cancer survivors because um, there's no, you know, cosmetic deformity associated with surgery or other um, things like that. So um, I like to be, I, I'm very optimistic about our track record treating breast cancer. Most women are cured, and I think that that's something that I like to stress to my patients as they um, are facing know, a callback from a mammogram or a biopsy or something else like that. You know, even in the worst case scenario, if um, that biopsy turns out to show breast cancer, that we have a very good track record and almost all women are cured. Dr. Glanders, thanks for joining us today. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We will uh, have this archived on our website at barnesjewish.org slash webinars. It's where we have the uh, entire series of these webinars that we do every other Wednesday. So you can find this one here and the schedule for upcoming webinars as well. Thanks to Brad, Scott, and Tracy for their help today from BJC Media Services. And we'll see you next time.